So where do we where do we end up? So we've got the cerebral peduncles, we've done the corporate public and I. We're just ready for a substantia nigra. Alright, so what we're doing is we're kind of moving up through the brain stem. And then once we move through the brain stem, we'll pass through the cerebral peduncles into the cerebral hemisphere and talk about that. So so the other things that are in the brain stem are a couple of kind of really uh, key areas to brain function. So remember a nucleus is a group of neuron cell bodies within the CNS, but more importantly, what part of the CNS? Gray matter or white matter? White matter. Yeah, but that's why that's why it has a unique name. The gray matter contains neuron cell bodies. So nuclei are neuron cell bodies in typically white matter areas. Okay. Okay. So the substantia nigra. So substantia, if something substantial is big, large. And nigra is a word for dark, so so it's actually a dark staining nucleus in, in the midbrain medulla. And the most important thing this substantia nigra does is it actually produces dopamine. And then dopamine is the key uh, neurotransmitter for controlling uh, un uh, skeletal muscle in terms of unconscious control of skeletal muscle. So Parkinson's is an absence of dopamine. So in Parkinson's, the substantia nigra begins to degenerate, stops producing dopamine. And then another part of the brain where the dopamine is real critical then is impacted by that. Uh, that we're going to talk about later when we get to the cerebral hemisphere called the basal ganglia. So what we do with Parkinson's is then we medicate with dopamine. And that's the way we try to manage Parkinson's disease uh, typically. Although there's a new surgery where we can use electrical stimulants to do it. Uh, so we're going to talk about that later. Uh, and then the red nucleus is just a relay area for motor tracks uh, that also coordinate muscle activity. Uh, so the red nucleus would also be an area where dopamine would be, be used within the brain itself. So those are in the midbrain or in the mesencephalon. So in this area of the brain, right in the <coughs> Okay. And then... Uh, we have an area of our brain that spans the brain stem up into uh, the cerebral cortex. So it is called uh, the reticular formation. And what the reticular formation is involved in is, is uh, producing uh, alertness, excitement, and sleep or lethargic behavior in the brain itself. So the way to think about the reticular formation is it's the one that makes you alert during the day. Uh, makes you sleep at night. And so the area within the mesencephalon is called the reticular activation system, or the RAS. And that's what allows you to wake up in the morning. So some people have uh, dysfunctions of the RAS, and, and they, they have incredible trouble waking up. Like eight alarm clocks around the house, somebody's shaking them to wake them up, because they just do not, their brain does not want to engage and become alert very rapidly, so it's kind of a cool system. All right. So when we're looking at the mesencephalon, so it could be this area of the brain right in here, uh, just above the pond, then what we're going to see is we have a nerve that arises on the lateral aspect of the mesencephalon, which would be nerve four, the trochlear nerve. And then remember yesterday from lab, the trochlear nerve would be involved in only one muscle in the eye, right? The superior oblique muscle. So, so if we if we kind of continue where we left off the other day and lecture and kind of draw the body, then 
we we were trying something at ears, had eyes, had a nose, had a mouth, had a tongue, and uh, and the ones we since we started at the bottom, then nerve twelve where we didn't go on our picture. So nerve twelve is the hypoglossal. So it would go under our tongue, right? And then nerve 11 did the neck and the muscles on the side of the neck, the sternocleidomastoid, the trapezius. So 11 would go here beside our neck. Then where did 10 go? Yeah, so 10, remember, goes to visceral organs like your heart and your lungs. So and kind of in your neck, so so we some of the muscles here, so ten would go here, kind of and down this direction. So then where did nine go? So glazo, so if we divide our tongue into into two thirds, then nine was on the posterior aspect of our tongue. And then it was also in our neck because it was involved in swallowing pharynx, so it was in our neck as well. So we have nine two places. And where did eight go? Here. Eight, remember, is our sensory only, one of our sensory only nerves, and it goes on the ears. Uh, that's involved in auditory and and equilibrium and balance. So then, where did seven go? Seven was our facial nerve. So seven does the, the muscles of facial expression. So we can either put it on both sides or just kind of span the whole thing with seven. Okay. And then uh, six. The eye, the lateral. Does only the lateral rectus, right? So we could put it on either side of our eye like that. And then five. Base, lower. And three branches, right? Ophthalmic branch, which does the surface of the eye area. And then maxillary branch, which does your upper jaw. And then mandibular branch that is your lower jaw. So we could kind of put it across our eyes, come down, <coughs> and go across our maxilla and mandible. And that will, now we're at yeah. four. And so where does four go? Eyes. So where would we put it to kind of remind us where it goes? Superior oblique would run along the upper part of the nose, so four would go here. All right. And then the other one is the ocular motor. So the ocular motor motor does everything else in the eye. So it does all of it does the superior oblique, inferior oblique, medial rectus, uh, inferior rectus, and then it does the internal part of the eye. So the muscles that change our pupil shape, uh, and the muscles that allow us to change from near vision to far vision. And so we can then kind of put that in the eye itself for three. Okay. All right, so then the second, and then we'll come back to this guy. So, the second largest area of the brain is our cerebellum. And the cerebellum actually is involved in coordinating muscle activity. Okay. And in the cerebellum itself is kind of cool because the white matter of the cerebellum kind of looks like the trunk of a tree with its branches. So the white matter of the cerebellum is called the arbor vitae. And then the gray matter has a folding pattern on it that makes it look like leaves of the tree. So that folding pattern is referred to as the folia. So you can kind of think of the cerebellum like a little bush or a tree. All right. And then what it does is it communicates with other parts of the brainstem and the cerebral cortex, particularly the frontal lobe of the cerebral cortex, which initiates skeletal muscle contraction to actually coordinate skeletal muscle contraction. And so because the sensory information from our muscles, proprioception, is coming up to the brain to be interpreted, 
and then the brain uh, initiates motor activity and it comes down the brain stem. Then we have, to, we have to have interconnections between the cerebellum and the brain stem itself. So the word we used for a structure that connects two areas of the brain was a peduncle. So we actually have three peduncles that connect the brain stem to the cerebellum. And we have three areas of our brain stem. The lowest area is the most inferior area. Just above the spinal cord would be the medulla. <coughs> the middle area would be the pons. And then the most superior area of the brain stem would be the one we just covered, which was the mesencephalon. So what we're going to have is we're going to have a connection from each of the areas of the brain stem. So the inferior cerebellar peduncle connects the medulla to the cerebellum. The middle cerebellar peduncle connects the pons to the cerebellum. And then the superior cerebellar peduncle connects the midbrain to the cerebellum. So there, there's connections from all of that because we have all of those pathways coming up through the, the brainstem to get to higher brainstem. That allows us then to coordinate muscle activity. So in animals, for example, in a cat, uh, the cerebral hemispheres of the cerebellum are about the same size. Whereas in ours, our cerebral hemispheres are much larger, but the cerebellum is still our second largest area of our brain to coordinate muscle activity. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to move into what we would consider the higher brain. And it develops from a primary embryonic area called the prosencephalon that subdivides into what two areas? Uh, Talencephalon and diencephalon. Uh, so remember that that development was linearly organized and then our brain enlarges and folds uh, to, in, so that we're up more upright in position. So the cerebral hemispheres surrounding the upper part of our brain develop from the telencephalon and then the more interior, inferior part so the thalamus here and the hypothalamus here are the ones that develop from the diencephalon. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the thalamus because it continues our thought process about uh, how sensory information is being conveyed upward to the, the central cortex of our brain, which is our parietal lobe of our brain. And then we'll look at the hypothalamus, which is below that. So. So as we looked uh, yesterday in lab, and we looked at those tracks that arise in the spinal cord for sensory information, we noticed that all of them started with the word spinal, and a number of them ended with the word thalamic, so spinal thalamic tracks. And so those tracks originate in the spinal cord, carrying sensory information upward. So we would say the tracks are affect, or excuse me, the peripheral information is afferent or efferent for sensory. Afferent. And then because it arises in the spinal cord uh, and moves up toward the brain, then it, is it ascending or descending? So when we're looking at the sensory pathway, it's all A. Afferent, ascending. Whereas the motor pathway is descending and efferent. So it's DE. Okay, when we're thinking about that, the connection of those two peripheral nervous system, the central nervous system, and the spinal cord. So what actually happens then is the thalamus is an incredibly important relay area for sensory apparatus. And so a lot of the, our sensations that come from the peripheral nervous system, apparently, are carried upward via the, the tracks, spinal thalamic tracks, ascending to the thalamus. And then third order neurons, which would be our third neuron in this pathway, would arise in the thalamus and go to a particular location on the post-central gyrus. And then what's our critical functional area on our post-central gyrus? Yeah, our primary somatosensory area. And that's where we are made aware of the, the event that's occurring in our body. And then we call that cognition, that we're cognitively aware of. So that's what we we're talking about with pain and other things. All we're doing is stimulating a receptor out here, and the brain makes us aware of the fact that that stimulation has occurred of our receptor. So then the brain projects the sensation back to your body. 
so that you're, you're aware of it. So that's the real critical thing that the thalamus does, is that it's the principal relay center for sensory impulses arising from this, from your body up to the spinal cord. And then it, 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 it helps in uh, with those third order neurons going to the appropriate area for cognition. And then what we saw is that the thalamus is actually left and right, uh, and it's separated by the third ventricle, and we have this cross connection uh, across the third ventricle, which was our landmark when we were looking at uh, a mid sizable section. So that was the intermediate mass of the thalamus. So in the sheep brains yesterday, the intermediate mass is really quite large. It's a nice big round structure uh, that is a landmark for, for recognizing it. Okay. So what we're just reviewing is the blue neuron would be our afferent neuron. And it's the first order neuron. Red neuron would be our ascending neuron. And it's the second order neuron. And then it terminates in the thalamus. And then the green neuron is our third order neuron. And it's the neuron that's responsible for relaying the, the impulse to the appropriate area on the somatosensory cortex for, for cognition to actually occur. So the thalamus is essentially a mass of gray matter surrounded by white matter in the brain. So, so we have all this white matter, which are the fibers rising off the cerebral cortex coming around. So we have this isolated dark area uh, of gray matter. So since it's gray matter within white matter areas of the brain, then we would say it's comprised of nuclei. And that was my, my point on, on nuclei, all right? So there are a number of nuclei within the thalamus itself, but there are, there are three that I want you to focus on because they're related to uh, the labs we're going to do next week. Uh, so the medial geniculate nucleus, and so it's going to be on the medial aspect of the thalamus, so toward the edge of the thalamus, where the third ventricle is, and here's the intermediate mass crossing the third ventricle. Then it is auditory sensations. So actually, the vestibular cochlear nerve that arises from our inner ear, the cochlear branch, actually uh, is relayed through the thalamus and goes to what lobe of the brain where our auditory areas are. On the sure look. Our temporal lobe, remember? Uh, superior temporal gyrus. So remember the the vestibular cochlear nerve were at the interface between the pons and the medulla here. And so they 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 exit the inner aspect of the skull where the apparatus is via that uh, internal acoustic meatus. Then the nerve comes back here. So what's actually gonna happen is the nerve is going to route through the balance and then new neurons are going to carry it over to this lobe of the temporal lobe of the brain right here for, for interpretation. Okay. So the medial geniculate nucleus is critical for our capacity to use auditory sensations. Uh, and then the lateral geniculate nucleus is going to be a relay center for visual impulses. So on Monday we're going to do the eye in the lab and we're going to dissect cheap eyes. And we'll talk about the pathway at which uh, information comes back. So the amazing thing about your eye is that as the optic nerve comes back, part of the fibers cross and go to the opposite side of the brain. So that when you're actually when you have one eye closed, you're actually using both sides of your brain because it crosses. And so. So what happens is once the, it's crossed, then the, the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus is actually going to be relaying the medial side of this eye to the opposite side of the brain, and then the lateral side of this eye that stays on the same side. So if you kind of divide your eye in half, the medial aspect of the retina crosses, the lateral aspect of the retina stays on the same side. 
And so what, what you would see with patients that have had trauma to the occipital lobe of the brain is they'll lose half the vision, half their visual field in each eye. And, and so we have to use some filters and some glasses to kind of help them learn to read again. So, because you, if you were doing it, you would see part of the sentence that would be absent and then there would be the other part of the sentence. And because part of your visual field would be done in each eye. So, so, so the lateral genetic nucleus, which is going to be on the lateral aspect over here, and then the ventral genetic nucleus is going to be down here toward the bottom of it, is, is actually uh, uh, a very important relay area for taste. And so what we were just talking about, and we forgot to put seven, where? Where is the other place we forgot seven? On the anterior two-thirds of the top here. So... So what we're saying is both the glossopharyngeal nerve and the facial nerve and in our pharynx, the vagus nerve, all carry taste sensations. And so those are going to be relayed through the ventral genetic nucleus uh, as well as somatic touch, somatic pressure, somatic temperature, <coughs> somatic pain are all uh, relayed through the ventral genetic nucleus. So it, to kind of put it together um, with what we were just talking about, then where this third order neuron cell body would be found within the thalamus would be what we would refer to as the nucleus. And so all we're saying is, is it, when you look at the thalamus, then specific areas of the thalamus have neuron cell bodies of third order neurons that carry specific pieces of of impulses from specific areas of the body. So it's just a mapping of, of the balances. So the other part of the diencephalon is the hypothalamus. And kind of the general um, way to think about the hypothalamus is that it's your biological brain. It controls much of your biological functions uh, that we think of in the body of the cell. So when we're looking superficially uh, at the brain, there are kind of two landmarks it would tell you uh, that you're where the thalamus, where the hypothalamus would be in the brain. So one would be the mammillary bodies we looked at. They're going to be on the posterior wall of the hypothalamus right here. And the mammillary bodies are relay centers for, for, a, for your sense of smell. So when we're looking at the brain inferiorly, remember there were there were olfactory bulbs that sit in the cribriform plate here, and then there was a tract that passed backwards called the olfactory tract. Well, the olfactory tract goes back to the mammillary body. So that's where it goes, and then it's relayed from there to, to other areas of the brain, again, where cognition is going to be occur for, for the sense of smell. And then the other thing that comes off the, the hypothalamus right here is our pituitary gland. Uh, and it actually, part of the pituitary gland actually develops from the hypothalamus and, and grows downward during embryonic development. Uh, so there's a direct connection then with the hypothalamus with the little stock that keeps the pituitary gland in place, which is the infundibulum. And then if we kind of went back and looked at our skull, then remember in the spinoid bone, and on the body of the spinoid bone that was mainline, that was the main part, there was that depressed area where it, we call the general area the cell because it kind of looks like a saddle. And then where you would sit in the saddle was called the hypophyseal fossa. Remember that from, from the skull? Well, what actually sits in the saddle is your pituitary gland. And since the pituitary gland's key role is maintaining homeostasis, then you actually surround it by the spinoid bone to protect it. That's why it sits in that saddle. Then in the front of the saddle, there was a little groove that we learned, uh, which went from one optic foramen across to the other optic foramen. And it was called a chiasmatic groove. And that's where the fibers that actually cross in the optic nerve actually sit and cross to the opposite side of the brain, kind of tying the structure together with the sun. Okay. 
Right. So when we look at the hypothalamus, it, it plays a real critical role with the body. So it controls and integrates the activity of the autonomic nervous system. So what we're going to do is we're going to fine tune something that we learned in the first unit. Uh, so in the first unit, one of the things I worked on was the idea of homeostasis. That our body tries to maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis gets disrupted and we try to come back. And as long as we can do that, we're fine and we're out. But as soon as our body can't maintain homeostasis, we end up in a clinical environment where medicine tries to help us maintain homeostasis. And then if we can't, then unfortunately we usually end up dying. Right. So what we said was there were two systems responsible for homeostasis, which was the endocrine system, which was kind of our slow system that worked with chemicals that we communicate within our body with called hormones. And then the other part was the nervous system. So the key role of the nervous system is actually the autonomic nervous system. And so that's the real key part of our nervous system for maintaining homeostasis. And so what we're going to do next week is talk about the role of, of, uh, of this area of the brain in, in doing that. Okay. So the way to think about the autonomic surface nervous system is it has two branches, uh, a sympathetic branch and a parasympathetic branch. And the branches have opposite effects on an organ. So for example, with your heart, if you're beginning to exercise and your need to deliver carbon dioxide to your lungs to get rid of goes up, and your need to deliver oxygen to your mitochondria so you can make ATP goes up, then the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system would accelerate your heart rate. Okay. And then once you're done exercising and you want to bring your heart rate down, then it's the parasympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system that brings your heart rate back down. So, so it's key to homeostasis because it has opposite effects on organs. Okay. And we're going to talk about that next week. All right. So then the other reason why the hypothalamus is key to homeostasis is that it controls the activity of the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland controls the activity of your endocrine system. So it also produces hormones that control the pituitary, that control the, the pituitary gland, and therefore it also is impacting homeostasis via the endocrine system. So the take-home message is the hypothalamus is the seat of homeostasis for your body, essentially. Okay? And then it also produces the hormones that control urine production, whether you produce concentrated smaller amounts of urine or more volume dilute urine is controlled by your hypothalamus. It also produces the hormone that controls labor contractions. And that's going to be a really fascinating area in, in the near future. For years, we understood that this hormone that controls labor contractions uh, was very important to the process of being able to breastfeed and being able to deliver a baby. And we didn't understand that we actually produce, both men and women produce this hormone, oxytocin, and that it's important to uh, behavior patterns in terms of mood. And, and emotional patterns. And we're learning now that, that it's very, very important in emotional patterns. And it explains some of the postpartum depression that women get uh, after they've been pregnant because of oxytocin levels. So that's going to really uh, change uh, our, our understanding of that hormone. And then the, the hypothalamus itself is a group of nuclei again, uh, so groups of neuron cell bodies that have particular. Uh, functions. So the hypothalamus also regulates our emotional and behavior patterns uh, related to rage, aggression, pain, pleasure, behavioral patterns related to sexual arousal are all modulated by the hypothalamus. You can see why I called it the biological brain. It's controlling a lot of what we think of as our biological functions. Um, so it also controls whether you're going to be hungry, whether you feel full, whether you feel thirsty, 
all of those feelings that we get are all being modulated by the hypothalamus. Yeah. So it was actually a drug that was taken off the market. I think it's going coming back on the market because they made a change to it. The drug was called FinFin, and it was a, one of the most potent uh, diet drugs that had ever been used. And it actually targeted the, the hypothalamus and targeted the hunger center in the hypothalamus and just turned it off, essentially, and, and then people never felt hungry. It actually caused valve damage in the heart. Yeah. That's, how, that's why they took it back off the market, because it was actually it had been related to valve damage in the heart. But they've now modified it, um, and, and it's probably going to come back on the market. All right. And then thirst center, like I said, it actually controls body temperature. So the hypothalamus is what regulates our, our basal metabolic activity and, and regulation of production of heat. Did it just turn off hunger or did it turn off everything? Well, actually, yeah, it had overlapping effects. So, so the one thing that was real, that the one thing that was most common was that it not only could, it not only tend to turn off the hunger center, but it turned off the thirst center. So when people were on it, they would have to consciously make themselves drink because they never felt thirsty. Then they get real dry mouths and stuff. So, so it didn't happen. They replaced it with some effort. All they did was they moved the molecules so it keep passing blood in the area. Right. There's their attention back on the market already. All right, cool. I, I had heard it I, about a year ago, so yeah. All right. So, um, so body temperature is controlled, remember, because anytime we make conversions from ATP to DP, ATP, we can harness part of the energy to do the biological work. But if you remember the laws of thermodynamics, anytime we convert one energy form to another, potential energy to kinetic energy, we're never 100% efficient. And the energy that we aren't efficient in ends up as what we call heat energy. So muscle mass is critically important to maintaining body temperature, which is oftentimes why women get cold quicker than men, because of the difference in body mass. And it's why as people age, they have more trouble regulating their body temperature as well, because you get a age-related age -related loss in body mass uh, as well. So kind of a cool pattern. And then it also regulates circadian rhythms, which are kind of your your day-night rhythms, whether you're a, a morning person, an evening person, uh, and those patterns, plus your states of consciousness. So a very important area of our brain. Okay, so, so we've kind of talked about some general, uh, general areas of brain and their major function. So remember what's, what separates the, the uh, frontal lobe from the parietal lobe is this deep groove right here that starts at the lateral sulcus and goes all the way up to the longitudinal sulcus. So that, deep, that deeper groove is the central. central sulcus. And it separates the frontal lobe from the parietal lobe. And what we talked about uh, is that the frontal lobe is uh, a voluntary control of skeletal muscle. So that's the posterior aspect of the frontal lobe. So our precentral gyrus is our primary motor area. And in this area in front of it right here is our motor cortex. But the, the front part of our frontal lobe, we know, deals with a lot of emotional uh, behavior patterns in people. So one thing they used to do in, uh, in, in, in hospitals like Eastern State Hospital is they used to do frontal lobotomies on patients where they'd remove that front part of the frontal lobe when the patients had behavioral problems and that man wanted this here. Because it took care it took away this front part of the brain that did emotional type of behavior patterns. So then behind the the central sulcus here, we have this gyrus called the post central gyrus, and then the rest of the parietal lobe. So remember that was somatosensory. So it's dealing with sensory cognition. And so the primary somatosensory area was on the postcentral gyrus, and then the rest of it is an association area. Our temporal lobe back here, which is separated by this deep, deeper gyrus, which is the parietal occipital sulcus, 
uh, was visual with our primary visual area toward the back of the occipital lobe, and then the rest of the occipital lobe, an association area for memory related to visual perception. And then our temporal lobe of our brain here, which is separated from the frontal, and the parietal lobe by this deeper division that runs back here, which was our lateral sulcus, uh, is going to be involved in memory. But what we talked about was this area right in here, which was auditory in lab, where we have a primary auditory area right in here, an auditory association area around it. And so those are kind of the basic things that we went over in lab as a quick review for the cerebral cortex. So essentially, what the cerebral cortex is, it is highly folded because brain matter is on the surface. Uh, and then the, the nerve fibers coming off the cell bodies in the gray matter form the white matter areas of the brain, which are more internal. And so the, what the cerebral cortex is, is highly folded to increase surface area to increase the number of neuron cell bodies we actually have on, within the cerebral cortex of our brain. And so what it is, it's, it's, it's an air connecting array of nuclei that if we're looking at the frontal lobe, would, would help to control subconscious control skeletal muscle tone and coordinate learned patterns of movement. So that was the thing we were talking about, which a recent study was looking at music and how people learn music. And when they, when they were, had people uh, and they were playing different music to them and getting them to try to remember the, the words of the songs and the pattern to the music, and they were taking images of where the brain was the active, they were surprised to find that it was that frontal lobe of the brain that we had largely assumed was for skeletal muscle activity. And since the, since the motor association area is specialized at sequential events, music is sequential, and that area of the brain was actually involved in, in that process. It's really All right, so what was our, what was the fifth lobe of the brain that we just didn't talk about because we can't see it on the surface? It was the insula, right? So remember that the insula is inside. All right, so the insula would be on the back side of, the, on the lateral side of the thalamus here. Uh, and so it would be kind of associated with this green area right here that we're looking at. So if we went back a couple of slides to this, to this slide right here, then here's the insula, here's the thalamus, and here's the, the corpus callosum we were just looking at. So you can see the insula is this lobe of the brain that we're seeing internally right here. And what we know is that the insula is important to, uh, it's a, a very important area of our brain for emotions. And it's part of what we call the limbic system. So our limbic system is the green area here, the yellow, the blue, and the red. Uh, which are areas of the brain that all interact uh, and form this limbic system. Uh, and so the one thing the limbic system does is it establishes our emotional states. And then it links our conscious intellectual functions with our unconscious autonomic functions. So it, it bridges the gap between the part of our brain that's working all the time that we're not aware of and the part of our brain that is our conscious being and our ability to, to do consciously make decisions and, and control emotions, okay? And then the third part is it plays a critical role in memory storage and retrieval. So the area of the limbic system that plays a critical role in facilitating memory storage and retrieval is this red area right here which is called the hippocampus, and it's in the temporal lobe of the brain. And the hippocampus is the area of the brain that we see that begins to degenerate first in, in, in patients with, with Alzheimer's. So it's the area of the brain that begins to degenerate first in this. And there's been quite a bit of work with Alzheimer's. We've now uh, identified a abnormal gene uh, that seems to be strongly correlated with the onset of, of Alzheimer's. And what we know is that our normal gene produces a protein molecule. Uh, and then the protein molecule 
covers the neurons and creates plaque on the outside of the neurons. And so once the plaque is formed on the neurons, they can't undergo depolarization, repolarization, and can't convey any impulses. And memory is a pathway of neurons. And so as soon as you remove one neuron out of the pathway, then that memory trace is absent. And, and then you don't have any memory related to that pathway. All right. So what we've been working on, what you've been working on all, all quarter in learning anatomy is creating new memory traces. And in those memory traces are, are what we understand at the more gross anatomy level of uh, how memory occurs. So we have to, move, we have to make a, a relationship between neurons in a pathway with synapses. Okay. And then as long as those pathways stay active, then the memory is easily recalled. So if you don't use it for a long time, then those memory traces become less active, and then it takes you longer to recall the memory. And then if, like I said, in Alzheimer's and in, de and in dementia, where you've got the death of neurons occurring, then the pathways begin to disappear, and then that memory is lost. So what we see in, in both dementia and Alzheimer's uh, it, as, as it begins to progress is the first thing we see is an inability to make new memory. So, so they won't remember things from an hour ago or a minute ago. So I always, look at, I always think about myself as I'm aging because sometimes I'll think, oh, I need to go do this. And I'll go in the other room and I get there and it's like, why did I come in here? And you're thinking, oh no, you're on your day. Then you go back to the other room and say, like, oh yeah, that's why. Because <laughs> when you went back, then there was something that stimulated that memory trace. It's like, oh, that's why. I went. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting. But what we see is that inability to do short term memory. And then as it progresses, there's an inability to, to remember things progressively backwards. So that oftentimes, uh, people with dementia revert to early periods of their life you know, because none of the more recent stuff is is there. So my, my mother has dementia. And she doesn't know who I am anymore. For a while she knew who I was when I moved her out here as she was going through it. And then she began to associate me with her older brother. And now when I go see her, she's clueless of who I am. So, and she's now, and I'll talk to her and say, oh, how, is it, how are you today? And she says, well, school was really hard today. Oh, really? What grade are you in? Oh, I'm in eighth grade. So, it's a very interesting world to live in. Yeah. So, anyway. so, to create memory, we have to have several things. So, if you're if you've learned something and you learned it real generally, and then you take another class and you learn it in more detail, you have to change that memory trace. So, you actually have to modify the memory trace so that you can alter that memory and re refine it. Okay. So that, that is synaptic plasticity, where through learning and experience, we have the ability to form new synapses, to remove old synapses, and to modify synapses between neurons. And that's, that's, what, we, that's what you guys have learned throughout your, your life, is you've learned things and you've had to modify it and upgrade that knowledge. So the thing that, that this whole process to me is, has always been fascinating, and I think when I have more time, I'll study it more and more in detail. But, but if you look at what you learned from the time you were born till, say, fourth grade, think about that. You learned to walk. You learned to talk. You'll never accomplish that feat again. You'll never be able to learn as much information for you at time as you did during that period of early life. And you're creating all these cool snacks and interconnections that you retain for the rest of your life, which is pretty amazing to think about. So not only do you have to uh, create these synapses, but there's, there's two processes, and one is called facilitation and the other is called potentiation. And they, they deal with calcium. So what was the role of calcium in the relationship between two neurons in, in a pathway? Releases. 
It releases neurotransmitters, right? So we actually have to build calcium up in our synaptic gimbal to release neurotransmitters. And then it goes to what we talked about, which was spatial and or temporal summation. So if we want actually the, the presynaptic neuron or neurons to be able to stimulate a postsynaptic neuron, the concentration of neurotransmitter becomes critical. And the more neurotransmitter we release, the more neurotransmitter that binds at ligand gated channels on the postsynaptic neuron, the greater the graded potential and the greater the chance that you're going to get a action potential at the trigger zone. <clears throat> and it's all based upon the amount of calcium that's entering the synaptic involved to cause release of neurotransmitter. Does that make sense? Yeah. So what facilitation uh, says is if we get rap rapid arrival of repeated si signals, so that would be that summation that we just talked about, either either temporal summation where it's one neuron stimulating the other rapidly, or spatial summation where we have a number of neurons stimulating the postsynaptic neuron simultaneously. Then what we're going to end up is, is building calcium up uh, in our, in our presynaptic uh, uh, axon terminals. And as the calcium level builds up inside, the release of neurotransmitter becomes quicker. So that's the process of uh, facilitation. And then potentiation, uh, it's the type of things that facilitates memories that last for a few hours. And it involves long-term buildup of calcium in presynaptic uh, neurons and increased release of, of uh, neurotransmitters uh, in terms of excitement in postsynaptic neurons. So what we know if, if, for learning is if you have present, been presented new material and you have an opportunity to, to review that new material within a few hours, then your chance of learning it is going to be better than if you were presented new information and then two days later you you try to remember what it was what what it was all about, right? So think about think about if you first got a computer and somebody showed you how to do something on a computer. If you did not do it right away and you waited for two days, what would be the likely outcome? Did you need the person to to show you again. So when I was learning PowerPoint to put all these presentations together, it was my daughter in eighth grade who was teaching me. <laughs> because she went to a private school and they got a grant from Microsoft to buy a bunch of computers and, 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 and of course, Microsoft software. And uh, so the, all the teachers, because they got this grant, were making all the kids do all their presentations using PowerPoint in the eighth grade. So she was really good at it. And she would get really mad at me because, you know, I, I would say, how do we do this? And then, then if I got preoccupied with something else, came back, I wouldn't remember how to do it. I'd say, hey, Aaron, how do you do that again? Dad, can't you remember anything? <laughs> <laughs> so then I learned, okay, if she tells me I'm going to have to sit here and do it <laughs> several times, so I'll remember how to do it. It's pretty funny. Okay, so when I think of memory, we can think of memory as immediate memory, which is the ability to hold something in memory just for a few seconds. That's critically important to reading. So, so if you're reading, uh, if you're reading, you have to remember what the first part of the sentence was about to have the sentence make any sense. So how many times have you started reading something and then you lose your focal point, and you have to reread and you reread and you reread several times, and then the longer the sentence, the more elaborate the thought process. Maybe like an anatomy book, then the more times you have to reread it to kind of make sense out of it, right? Yeah. So that whole process is is immediate memory. And so what we see is as you age, it becomes harder and harder to learn new stuff. The old saying, can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. Because our immediate memory is impacted by age. Yeah. All right. So when we look at short-term memory, which is STM, uh, then short-term memory is something that lasts for a few seconds to a few hours, and it's quickly forgotten if not reinforced. So that's the key I was telling you about, where if you have thought about something new, you have to reinforce it. You have to rethink about it within a reasonably short period of time. 
And unfortunately, as you age, the time frame is shorter and shorter and shorter, the which you have to think about it. Um, and so, so that you can convert it to long-term memory. Now, working memory is a form of short-term memory that's critical that we take for granted, which is, for example, the ability to look up phone numbers and remember long enough to dial a phone. So, so in the modern world, that's not even an issue anymore because you just push a button. You don't even have to remember the phone number because all you do is pushing a button on your smartphone. And you're depending on your, your phone's working memory instead of yours. But years ago, when you actually had to look it up in a phone book and then try to remember it, I remember as I was getting older, I'd have to write it down because I couldn't remember it. But I'd look it up, go to the phone. Of course, that was when we only had one phone in the house, <laughs> or maybe two phones, but they were connected to the wall, so you couldn't go anywhere. You guys probably don't remember any of that. All right, so long-term memory, LTM, is the memory we, were, we, we uh, depend on for a lifetime. So that's kind of the role of uh, getting a degree in a specific field that you're going to engage in for a career, because you have to remember this stuff that you're going to use the rest of your life. Right? So the part about anatomy that I always find fascinating is, you know, you, when you take anatomy, you don't, most people just don't take it for fun. It's not a class they would say, oh, that looks like fun, I'll take it. They usually take it because you're going into a program that requires you to know something about the human body, right? So it's going to be something you're going to depend on the rest of your life. Well, the good news is, because you constantly reinforce it in your career, then you retain this, this memory for a long period of time. And it involves remodeling synapses, the formation of new synapses, Creating branches, we haven't really talked about that, but we always think of uh, neurons as having this long, linear uh, axon, but axons can actually have branches so that they can go to different neurons. So, so you can actually create a network. So in thinking about what we were talking about and kind of putting it into context, so remember we looked at pathways in which neurons interact, and one of the pathways were diverging pathways. In a diverging pathway, you had one neuron that eventually was stimulating a number of neurons. And the way you would create a diverging pathway is you'd have to keep, create branching patterns. You'd have to create branching patterns with, with neurons themselves. Right? And then when we look at memory, uh, we have two types of memory, and, and some of us uh, have a, a, a unique ability to do one of these types of memory better than the other type of memory. And so there's declarative memory, which is the retention of events, facts, that you can put into words, numbers, names, and dates. So I always think about my wife and I, because I can remember, like when we were dating many years ago, what day we went out and ate, and what we ate, and where we were, and my wife's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> because I have a very good declarative memory, and hers isn't as good. So it's really interesting. Then procedural memory, which is motor skills, how to tie a shoe, how to play a musical instrument, how to type on a keyboard. And the skill set that you learn uh, for, for certain things in your career, like how to use tools or how to do surgeries if you're a physician, that really requires this procedural memory that, that, that's very important. So it's, just, it's kind of a cool process. All right, so I'm going to kind of end up with that structure that I talked about, which was associated with Parkinson's disease, which is the basal ganglia. So the basal ganglia is misnamed because it's part of the central nervous system. So why is it misnamed? Because ganglia are in the PNS. So, so there's a move to rename it in textbooks the basal nuclea. Yeah. Because uh, cause it's, a, again, a number of nuclei that interact with each other. So it essentially is the red area here, uh, and the, kind of your landmark they're trying to show you internally would be the thalamus itself. Um, and so it involves a number of different nuclei, the cotton nuclei, the lymphoma nuclei, and some others. So what the basal ganglia is involved in is 
uh, subconscious control of skeletal muscle tone and coordinate patterns of, of, of learned patterns of, of muscle activity. And these nuclei I don't initiate it because it's the frontal cortex that initiates skeletal muscle activity. But what they do is, as you begin a voluntary motion, the basal ganglia adjusts the control of, of the muscles involved in whatever movement you're making with your appendage. So if you think about this, and you, and you kind of think back about kind of what we talked about in, in muscle physiology, is there, was, there were two types of, of, of concentric, there were two types of isotonic contractions. So there was concentric contraction and eccentric contraction. And a concentric contraction would be the prime movers that are creating the activity, and the eccentric contractions would be the antagonists that are wanting to resist that. And so what you do, what the basal ganglia is doing is helping control the activity of those muscle cells in a learned pattern so that you can create a particular activity. And so what happens when the basal ganglia begins to fail because of lack of neurotransmitters like uh, like in uh, Parkinson's disease with an absence of dopamine, or in dementia where you get uh, a Parkinson's-like symptom from dementia, uh, dementia tremors, uh, where there's just a loss of neurons in the brain, is you lose the ability to do this subconscious control, so you begin to get uh, tremors where the control is, is actually uh, beginning to fail. So we're going to have some eye models we look at, and then we're also going to dissect sheep eyes, so, so we can kind of see the internal anatomy in, in a real eye itself. So part of it is something you can do at home in a mirror, just look, look in your eye and do the external anatomy of the eye. So, so we have a high-tech name for our eyelashes, so our eyelashes are uh, pilgrims. So where did we see that word before? In a muscle. And the muscle was what opened our eyes because it elevates our upper eyelid. So it was the levator, palpilbrae, superioris, yeah. And so we got a name for the technical name for eyelashes. All right. And so we actually have a lower eyelid with eyelashes, so the lower palpilbral. And we have an upper eyelid with eyelashes, so the upper palpilbral. Where the two limbs come together are commissures. So interconnections again, same way we used it in the third system. So we have a lateral commissure which would be on the outside of our eye, and we have a medial commissure which would be on the inside of our eye. And then where our medial commissure is, we have a disc of connective tissue that uh, we see right there, and that's called the lacrimal carnuncle. And that's actually where if you have uh, some debris that builds up in your eye overnight, what we're actually doing is we're constantly making tears to wash our eyes. So if we didn't do that, your eyes would eventually be like the windshield in windshield your car. Because we're moving through an environment where there's dust particles and stuff in the air, and they're collecting on our eyes. So we constantly make tears and we move toward the lacrimal carnuncle, uh, where the tears are going to be reabsorbed. And so what happens sometimes is if we get quite a bit of dust and stuff in our eyes, it moves over and then it gets deposited right there on the lacrimal carnuncle instead of being absorbed. And so we call that sleep, yeah. You see it in cat's eyes and dog's eyes, yeah. so it's really just cool. All right, so then the pupil is actually an opening through which light passes into your eye. The back of your eye has a really heavy pigmented uh, layer that's pigmented with with uh, melanin, the same pigment that pigments our skin, except it's heavy, so it's black. And when we think about colors and light, then colors 
uh, the absence of color is black because light is being absorbed. If all the visual spectrum of light is being reflected, then it's white. So our two extremes when we think about color are black and white. The absence of color on one side because no light is being reflected off the object. And then all light being reflected off the object on the other side, which makes something appear white. And the colors in between that our eyes are designed to see then are the, the visual color spectrum that we think of, blues, reds, greens, yellows, okay? And so the opening, the pupil appears black because as light enters our, our eye, it's absorbed and it's not reflected backwards. And so since there's no reflection back out of the eye, then it appears black. So now if you use a strobe, like on a camera, where the light is greater intensity, we actually get a reflection of light off of hemoglobin in the blood vessels in the back of our eye. And so usually in a camera, your eyes, your pupils can look red. And that's just a reflection of light off the hemoglobin because it's a more intense light in your eye it is normally exposed to. So it's kind of interesting to think of that. So then around the pupil of our eye, we have a pigmented layer of the eye called the iris. And in the iris of the eye, uh, and the pigmentation process is genetically controlled. And so what's pretty fascinating about it is that the, the dominant pigment again is melanin. Uh, and so what we would, our two extremes would be uh, the the iris of the eye would be pink. And we would see that in albinoism. Yeah. And again, that's the reflection of, of light uh, from hemoglobin. So it's the reflection of light from hemoglobin. So you have, you have a vascular network in the, in the iris of the eye. So the light's being reflected off. So that's why albino animals like like uh, mice and rats have pink eyes. Actually, albino humans have pink eyes. Right? So then the other extreme over here would be brown eyes. So then brown eyes are due to melanin. And so there's a very strong correlation with skin color, hair color, and Iris. So usually people who have very dark brown hair also have brown eyes. People who tend to have darker skin typically have brown eyes. So if we think about it, what probably happened was everybody had brown eyes at one point in time. Whether you want to, whether it was Adam and Eve or however you want to believe how we came about, but but what's actually happened is we've developed some gene mutations. And then the gene mutations are what's responsible for other eye colors that we see right now. So the way to think about it is that we have a biochemical pathway and we have these enzymes that are required to allow us to make this brown pigment. And as long as you have all the enzymes in the sequence correct, then you're going to have brown eyes. So if this enzyme is defective, then it doesn't matter whether you're making these or not because you don't have the precursor molecule that the next enzyme is going to work on. And so then you would have blue eyes. So blue eyes are a gene mutation to this process. Now, what's pretty fascinating uh, and thinking about populations and gene movement within populations is that as we move away from the equator toward the poles, brown eyes, blue eyes become more common in populations. And really in, in Europe, in the Scandinavian countries in particular. So that might tell us where the gene mutation actually occurred. Now, the fascinating thing is it also occurs in animals. 
So if you looked at wolves that are Mexican wolves, for example, uh, closer to the equator, all brown eyes. But as you go to Arctic wolves, you have an increase of abundance of blue-eyed animals. So then the question is, when you think about genes, mutations, and the influence of the environment that we live in and how it impacts it, is, is there a significance to, to brown eyes in the tropics? And what we talked about was the fact that, uh, that melanin reflects UV light, so it's protecting to the eyes as we move toward the poles. You know, what, what's the advantage of blue eyes? I don't know the answer, but the pattern exists. <laughs> yeah. so, so it's pretty cool. So then if you have a gene mutation here, you're going to have, have green eyes in this that kind of pattern. So then what we know is that to have the dominant pathway would be to have all the all these enzymes that allow us to make melanin, then we'd have brown eyes. If you have a gene mutation for this first one, then you have blue eyes. And and then what we do know is that if you have two genes, one for brown and one for blue, that the most dominant pattern is going to be that you're going to have brown eyes. But there are some people and some animals that get one brown eye and one blue eye. Which just means that the different genes are being expressed in the different eyes. So when we teach genetics, we always talk about dominant recessive as a pattern that always exists, but it's not that simplicity. Yeah. So when I used to raise huskies, I used to try to breed them so that I always got blue-eyed dogs because people would pay you more money for a blue-eyed puppy than a brown-eyed puppy. But every once in a while, I would get a blue one, a, a husky with one blue eye and one brown eye, and people would pay even more money for that. So it was always kind of pay game. Okay, last time when this when this male dog and this female dog got together, I got these two colored eyes, but it didn't always work. Hard <laughs> genetic reassortment. <laughs> anyway, so it was kind of cool. Yeah. So what about when there's two different colors in one eye? Uh, again, so so the way to think about it is. Every cell has the full complement of genetic material. So in simplistic genetics, we just say, well, the dominant gene is always expressed, uh, and the non-dominant gene is not expressed. But because each, you have, each cell in your iris has both genes, you can actually have uh, part of the eye blue and part of the eye brown, the same iris, yeah. Because a different gene and different cells were turned on during embryonic development, yeah. and we know that with a couple of with a couple of uh, chromosomes in particular. So every every woman has two X chromosomes, and there are a couple of there are a couple of things that we could see where in one part of the body one one X chromosome was turned on, but in another part of the body the other X chromosome was turned. And so we, we've, we've looked at that in, in X chromosomes in, in some detail. I've heard of, I've read people who can change their eye color with mood. Is that? Uh, well, so one way to think about that would be uh, because of the because of the the influence of quote unquote mood on vasodilation and vasoconstriction. Mm -hmm then you're changing blood flow patterns. And so if you have hemoglobin reflecting red light and another, and another uh, uh, pigment reflecting a different color light, then you've got, you've got multiple colors being invested in that one color. So uh, just, uh, just, uh, just uh, blood flow can change some color patterns. Um, and then, uh, and then some pigments and enzymes are, are very heat sensitive, so they can be altered by, by temperatures. So a classic example of that would be Siamese cats, where their feet are black and their ears are black, but the rest of the body is gray. Uh, that's actually a temperature impacting an enzyme that's, that's, impacting, uh, that's, that's actually impacting color. So, so body temperature in some ways can do it as well. But I think by and large, it's probably the quality of light that's entering the eye, that's reflecting the eye. Because I, I, I do a lot of work with birds and 
So a lot of people in the community know that I do. So I get calls here all the time about birds. And so people call me and say, hey, I got this duck on my pond. It looks like a mallard, but its head's purple. <laughs> Instead of green, I'd say, well, you know, what? when did you see the purple head? And, and was it a cloudy day? Was it a sunny day? Was it early morning? And just the quality of light will change the color of the bird. And, and so, so sometimes that can be just the quality of light that you're in and not really your mood. So. Well, and I wonder if it's what they wear. I know my husband, depending on what he wears, his eyes could be blue or green. Mm -hmm. And so, so what we're doing there, yeah. yeah. So what we're doing there is we're reflecting light off the colors of our clothes. And then that light is bouncing into our eyes. So instead of having full spectrum light uh, that's reflecting back off our eyes, it's a skewed spectrum of light that bounces off our eyes. Uh, and so that's kind of that would be similar to going to a clothing store, looking at colors, and then no, this is true because they don't use they, they they use special lights in some clothing stores. And then you go home, and it's like I would never pick this color. <laughs> <laughs> And so sometimes I'll go to a window where I can look at it and because the, the you can buy different bulbs, they have different spectrum. And most of the bulbs we use normally are not full spectrum. But if you bought bulbs that are for like greenhouses or grow lights, those are full spectrum. And they change the color. They change color on them. Yeah. So so yeah, just the reflection of light can impact color of your eyes as well. So, how do contacts work? How can we use contacts to change the color of the lens? Yeah, because contacts, contacts are designed with pigments that reflect light differently. So we're just reflecting the light off the glass in front of our iris. Yeah. So, so that's, that's just, color is so cool when you, when you think about color. All right, so what we were just talking about is the fact that we have to clean our eyes all the time because we're wandering through a maze of dust particles. In here, there's probably several hundred million skin particles from all of us floating around, landing on our eyes because we've all been in here for an hour and a half. And so what we have to do is constantly wash our eyes. So we actually have a gland called our lacrimal gland, which is in the superior lateral aspect of the eye up here. And then it produces tears, which we call lacrimal solution or fluid, at a fairly constant rate. And they're released by a number of little ducts, uh, which are the excretory ducts, uh, to the inside of your upper eyelid. So if you ever, you could actually take your upper eyelid and fold it out, fold it backwards, and you actually see these little ducts. But you gotta have nonsense to your eyes to be able to do that. <coughs> Right. Then what we do is we blink all the time, and that helps us move fluid across our eyes. So what we have to do is we have to pick the fluid up. So we have we have here our lacrimal carnuncle, two little openings, and so they're called uh, puncta or punctum. So we have a superior lacrimal punctum and an inferior lacrimal punctum, one on our upper eyelid and one on our lower eyelid, and then the puncta are are associated with canals. So we have a superior lacrimal canal and an inferior lacrimal canal. Now when we did the skull, we learned a little groove right next to our nose there, which was our lacrimal groove or lacrimal sulcus. So what sits in the lacrimal groove or the lacrimal sulcus is an area that collects your tears, which is called your lacrimal sac. And at the bottom of the lacrimal groove, there was actually a hole that went into your nose. I didn't put it on your, your list for your, for your skull, but it, it's the lacrimal foramen. Now what passes down through this lacrimal foramen is a nasal lacrimal duct. And so what you're doing all day long is you're making tears. They're moving them across your eye. You're collecting them and dumping them into your nose. Underneath your inferior consciousness. And then that helps our nose stay moist as we breathe in and out. Because airflow over our nose tends to dry our nose out. So in normal physiology, the production is at a rate where evaporation typically is taking care of this fluid. 
So if we become emotionally upset and or have an allergy that makes us produce more lacrimal solution, then our nose runs because now you're producing solution at a greater rate and you're not evaporating it. And so now it runs out of your nose. And if you produce so much lacrimal solution that the puncta can't collect it, then it runs off your face as what we call tears. Yeah, that's just an all an increased production in, in lacrimal solution. So, so it's, it's really kind of cool. Anyway, so, so there's one thing that happens, and, and, and clinically where we see it more is when, when some people have LASIK surgery, and I think uh, probably because when you do LASIK surgery, you use a little uh, expander that you put on the eyelids so that while the surgery is being done, the eye cannot be shut. And so it's probably altering those, the openings to the excretory ducts. And then after LASIK surgery, uh, for a while, and some, and some people more permanently, uh, they don't produce as many tears and their eyes dry out all the time. And they have to use eye drops all the time because their eyes don't produce as many tears. And so one of the things they'll do is they'll take plugs, little tiny plugs, and they'll insert them into the puncta. And, and then that'll prevent the tears from actually being able to enter your nose, so it retains them on the surface of the eye and it keeps the eye moist and eventually evaporates off the surface of the eye. So some people have to have those plugs put in permanently uh, after LASIK surgery to manage the, the fluid on the surface of their eye. And they use dissolving ones that they put in and then eventually they dissolve and see if your eyes go back to normal. So I know somebody who had LASIK surgery who had their eyes dried, they put the plugs in, and then one of the plugs actually disappeared. So they figured the plug was somewhere in the canal. So, so what they did is they took, uh, they took a syringe and they stick it in the oak, they, they stuck it in the plastic syringe, they stuck it in the opening uh, of the lacrimal duct and pushed saline solution and squirted it out of their eyes and from the punctum trying to push that plug back out of the canal. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, it took quite a while though. Yeah, they eventually had to also put, put the plastic syringe in the pump and try to shove it the other way out of their nose. Yeah. So doesn't that little effect in the nasal? Yeah. Um, yeah, usually your toe nose would tend to be a little dry. Yeah. Okay, so I'm out of time. So we'll finish the anatomy part of this. Uh,